Good afternoon, everyone. Could the person who left the bomb in the middle of the floor here please remove it? Welcome to Girton College. We're absolutely delighted to have so many people here in person. It's great to have face-to-face -face meetings, so really appreciate you making the effort. As one of the students said to me yesterday, we're just not sure how we're going to get back to Cambridge tomorrow night. <laughs> so I'm very pleased that you all think this is still in Cambridge and um, uh, the transport is from here is actually really good. And hopefully you've had free car parking outside and um, yeah, and everyone's kind of found the room. I have to say I slightly struggled down the maze, but it's just great. These are lovely buildings and lovely facilities. So we're going to be here and then we'll go back to the hall that we're in for, for afternoon tea. And then afterwards we'll have the drinks reception and then the room for dinner is behind. If you're not signed up for dinner, please have a look at these rooms because they're it's just it, it's lovely. It, it, it's really kind of historic college here and it's and it's so nice that they're we're being hosted. Please come in. So this meeting is important to this region because it brings together the radiologists and the trainees from across the region. And it means that we can... Um, we cannot quite hear you. You were speaking a little louder, please. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Mic's on. So, apologies. I hope I will speak more loudly and, and, as my father said, enunciate your words more clearly. Still can't hear. Okay. Is this microphone, is that working? No. Is this one working? Is this one working? Oh. Let me give Fiona this. Speaking to there. There we go. Good afternoon, Good everyone. Friday. My rather rambling speech was welcome. Girton's a great college, and it's so good to have the regional radiologists and trainees all together. Please make sure you take the opportunity to meet each other, make new friends and make new interactions. So without further ado, I am going to introduce, I have enormous pleasure about introducing Dr. Sue Barter, who won the gold medal at the European Congress of Radiology this year. It was just such a pleasure to see her up there. It was just terrific. And we had a lovely uh, night out and a dinner with the, with the Cambridge group. Um, Sue, is, Sue said to me, I've no idea why I got this. I am not going to tell you all the reasons why you got this. It's on the ECR website um, if you want to have a quick look. But Sue is going to hopefully tell us a little bit about her career and how, in fact, she's made the most enormous difference to education and radiology across Europe. So congratulations. Thank you. Right, thank you, Fiona. But... Aha, we're there. Okay, thanks. So I'm not sure about this. Well, when Fiona asked me to come and give this talk, she said, I want you to come and talk to Ears and celebrate your gold medal. And, uh, you know, tell us a bit about your career and what you've done in Europe. And I thought, oh my God, I can't think of anything worse than sitting listening to me talking about myself. Can't think of anything worse than actually talking about myself for 20 minutes, never mind and all that. And I said, you know what, I'm really suffering from imposter syndrome. So I thought, well, I'll tell you a bit about imposter syndrome because that's actually quite important. And I bet you quite a lot of us, our high flyers in this room have had it at some point. So it's going to be a bit about um, the imposter syndrome and a bit about my career and uh, how I got involved with the Royal College of Radiologists and the European Society of Radiology. Um, yes, there is nothing 
more scary than seeing your face projected, I don't know whether this is funny, you know, bigger than me on the stage there when you get the gold medal. And I thought the gold medal would be sort of nice and round and I could pin it on my lapel or something. But no, it's big and square and very heavy. But I'm assured that it's not real gold, otherwise I could have made a bit of money on it. Um, so there was me getting the gold medal. And when I was told um, in October 2021 that I was going to be the gold me medal recipient, I thought, holy, and then an expletive that I can't repeat in this room. And I looked at previous gold medalists. And what's very interesting, there have been 14 gold medalists from the UK since the um, beginning of um, 1993 when ESR started. Four of those have been from Cambridge. There is Dr. Chris Flower, and I really apologize, Chris, because I could not find a picture of you anywhere on the internet. You're very secretive and shy. Professor Adrian Dixon, of course, who we all know very well, who's published enormously on CT, anatomy, um, diagnostic radiology, and aspects of all sorts of effectiveness within radiology, and who has served not only as editor-in-chief um, and clinical of European radiology and clinical radiology, but he's been college warden and numerous awards and helped over raise over 15 million state for state-of-the-art equipment at Cambridge and it's very difficult to find out exactly how many papers he's published on the internet because again he's very reticent about this and it just says numerous so we'll have to accept that. <laughs> Professor Gilbert awarded 15 competitive grants worth over 25 million and over 220 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters I was starting to feel just a little bit inadequate by this point. And she's, of course, well known to everybody as a regular speaker at, at conferences. And then if we look at the other gold medalists, I mean, I'll just briefly run through some of the better known names. Professor Anna Maria Belli, you know, 160 peer reviewed publications, three books, numerous book chapters, the first and only president, female president of the British Society of Interventional Radiology, and the first female president of CIRSI, which is the um, European Cardiovascular and Essential Radiology Society. Prof Golding, president of the British Institute of Radiology. Ian McColl, president, previous warden and registrar of the college. Andy Adam, well, Professor Andy Adam, numerous awards, uh, 14 eponymous lectures, many, many books. Helen Carty, Robert Steiner, and then me. So I was really beginning to feel slightly inadequate and thinking they must have made a mistake. But they hadn't. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to learn a little bit about imposter syndrome. And it's defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as the persistent inability to believe that your success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of your own efforts or skills. And I was first introduced to this by um, Peter Britton, one of my colleagues in Cambridge Press Unit. And it's the idea that you've only succeeded due to luck and not because of your talent or qualifications. It happened when we were um, all invited to give lectures at a previous European Congress of Radiology. And I was standing there thinking, <gasps> you know, there's Pete, who's really well known and lectured a lot. There's Professor Christiana Cool, who's Na, you know, internationally known for all her work on, on breast. Um, Fiona, before she joined Cambridge, and I was really feeling very inadequate. So, you know, it's a belief that your achievements are undeserved. You feel as if you aren't as complicated, uh, sorry, as competent and intelligent as others might think, and that soon you'll be discovered what you really are, a bit of a fraud. Those with imposter syndrome are often highly accomplished. And uh, when Pete, Peter Britton told me about this and said, oh, well, I often feel like that, I started to feel a bit better. It was first identified in 1978 by two women psychologists, Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes, and they published a paper where they theorized that both, that only women were affected by imposter syndrome, but subsequently that's not shown to be true. Both women and men um, experience imposter feelings, 
And Clance later published a paper acknowledging that it wasn't limited to women. And basically it can apply to anybody who isn't able to internalize and own their successes. And that definition comes from um, the College of Psychologists. And how common is it? Well, again, research has shown that probably about 25 to 30% of high achievers may suffer from it. And at least 70% of adults, which I find an enormous figure, may experience imposterism at least once in their lifetime. Um, various types of imposter syndrome have been identified and uh, I skipped a slide, no, I haven't. Um, they are the superhero, the natural genius, the expert, the perfectionist and the soloist. So let's just have a look at these and see how, how many of these are you. So the superhero, um, these individuals feel inadequate and feel compelled to push themselves to work as hard as possible with consequences on their mental, physical and emotional health. And they're prone to suffer from burnout and they find it difficult to enjoy either their work or their home life because they haven't got the right work-life balance. The natural genius sets themselves exceedingly high goals and are crushed when these goals aren't met. The expert is never satisfied with their level of understanding and is always trying to learn more about a particular topic. Um, highly skilled, they underrate their own performance and the time spent, they can waste hours searching for more information so that they make sure they've got everything um, instead of uh, using that time better to complete other tasks. Then there's the perfectionist, never satisfied with their work, um, fixated on their flaws or mistakes instead of focusing on their strengths. They set impossibly high standards for themselves, which often leads to self-pressure and high amounts of anxiety. And last but not least, there's the soloist. Um, they tend to be very individualistic. They prefer to work alone. Um, Self-worth stems from their productivity and they won't ask for help for seeming weak or incompetent. Now, I reckon I'm a bit of a mix here. I think I'm a bit uh, of a superwoman and also probably a bit of um, a perfectionist. Um, so risks and triggers have been identified for imposter syndrome. And the risks are a family environment. If you come from a family where you're really pushed um, and failure is seen as failure and, and not as a step to get over and encouraged to move on, um, you're more likely to suffer from imposter <coughs> syndrome, excuse me. Then there are social and work pressures. There's that feeling that everybody else in the department is far better and more knowledgeable than you. And that sort of ties in with a sense of belonging to a department. And then there's your underlying personality traits. If you're um, naturally a rather anxious or depressive person, you're at risk. And triggers, um, ironically can be acknowledgement of success um, so that you know if you actually uh, get an award or acknowledgement of your success it can make you feel worse um, passing an exam or being promoted and failure after a string of successes in those who are very successful can also um, cause them to critique and question their overall attitude so why is this an issue well Mental, physical and emotional well-being are obviously impacted and there's a risk of burnout, um, risk of anxiety and depression, the inability to really enjoy your successes. And there's also an inhibition of sharing ideas because you think, oh, my ideas aren't going to be good enough um, or applying for positions that, you know, you might really benefit from. And thinking you're not good enough may cause you to miss out on really good career opportunities or work opportunities. And people often struggle in silence. There are recognized strategies to cope. And, uh, the, you know, one is to break the silence. Shame keeps a lot of people from talking about their feelings um, and, you know, feeling, feeling a fraud. Um, but knowing that there's a name for these feelings and you're not alone can be tremendously liberating. Um, then there are times when you'll make mistakes. So recognizing that feelings aren't facts, there are times when you'll make mistakes or feel stupid. And that happens to everybody from time to time. 
Um, but it doesn't mean that you are stupid. It's just, you know, a mistake and it's important to move on. Um, recognizing the feeling, um, a, ooh, I think something's funny here. Um, and that is a sense that sort of ties in with a sense of belonging. If you're um, the only one of a few people in a meeting or a classroom, um, not a classroom, a lecture room or, or, or a workplace, and there's lots of people who sort of don't look like you or they're much older or much younger, it's only natural that you feel something that you don't totally belong and fit in. Um, but that isn't really uh, a sign or that you're an imposter. It's not a sign of your ineptness. It's just a normal response. So failure won't kill you. The good news about having such feelings is that it means you care deeply about what you're doing and about your work. And the key is to carry on striving for excellence, um, but don't focus too much on your mistakes and forgive yourself. Rethink the rules. Well, Henry Ford once said that failure is only the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. So instead of beating yourself up if you fall short, um, just learn from the loss and move on. Rethink the rules. If you've been operating under rules like I should always know the answer or never start, never ask for help, you need to rethink again. You have just as much right as the next person to be uncertain about something and ask for help. Um, flip the script. This is a bit American, isn't it, really? But um, it's important to recognize that um, the feelings that trigger your imposter uh, feelings, that's your internal script. And it would go something like, you know, oh, God, wait till they find out that I have no idea what I'm talking about, um, you know. But remember that everybody who starts something new feels a bit uncertain in the beginning and um, instead of looking around the room and thinking oh my god everybody here is brilliant just like you lot I'm really you know think actually everybody here is brilliant I'm going to learn a lot visualize success that's what professional athletes do they visual you know visualize yourself giving a successful lecture and uh, that will help deal with the stress Reward yourself, break the cycle of continually seeking everybody else's approval um, and learn to pat yourself on the back. And then fake it till you make it. That's a bit American again as well, isn't it? But it's everybody, all of us, all of us have to learn to wig it at some time and fly by the seat of our pants. And this isn't, this isn't proof of our ineptness at all. Many high achievers, view it as a skill, being able to wing it. And so the point of this rather worn out phrase, fake, fake it till you make it, still stands. So that's imposter syndrome. And that is why I have got it in spades, um, surrounded by, especially at Cambridge, by all these amazing people. And I think if, if you look back at my career, you'll realize why. Um, in 1980, I'm not sure what time we started, so I'm busy keeping an eye on the clock and it says half past, five minutes. Great, okay. So in 1980, I started as a trainee at the Hammersmith Hospital in London and um, Tom Sherwood will remember this very well. I'm delighted to see him here. The radiology department. Will it point? Yes, it will. No, it won't point very well up there. It's a blue background. Anyway, the radiology department was on the first floor there in the, in the corner, this far corner. Um, and it was a lovely department. Um, Professor Steiner, who was head of the department, was an amazing man, um, so encouraging. Um, it had about equal numbers of men and women as trainees, but all the five professors and consultants were men. Five consultants in those days. Can you imagine it? Um, but he was very, he was very, very, uh, what's the word? enlightened and encouraged part-time working for trainees with young children. It was very different training to today. We spent hours um, doing screening lists, injecting IVUs, plain film reporting, um, and pumping for the cardiologists, which we used to call pimping, Tom might remember this, where you had to fill up the angio pump for the cardiologist, make sure there was no air in it. Quite how that contributed to my radiological knowledge, I still don't know. 
huge long waits for processing, especially when you're waiting for an angio series to spit out of the processor, just standing there, it's like watching uh, paint dry. But, um, C sorry, just go back. CT was installed in 1981 and the MRI prototype in 1981. Um, so, you know, just a few examples of what we used to do. Barium swallows, I view, all replaced. Air encephalograms, injecting air into the lumbar spine and then tipping the patient around um, till, so we could see whether the ventricles were displaced. Lymphangiography, hours spending doing lymphangiography, now replaced. And what a bonus that is. And this was our first MRI scanner. And this picture at the bottom here shows the head coils. I mean, it was so Heath Robinson-ish, it just doesn't bear thinking about. And then, you know, we get CTs, 20, 20 images on one sheet. And it horrifies me to think how much we missed now compared to what we get now. But there again, it was better than what we had before. So I suppose, you know, it all evolves. And this was an MRI, you can almost count the pixels. I then went on to be a specialist registrar at St Mary's Hospital Paddington and the attitudes there were very different. I was a, the only female trainee um, and I was expected to screen while I was pregnant and there was a lot of um, reluctance to treat me as an equal. Then came consultant post. Ealing Hospital um, in 1998 to 1999 and that's because um, I didn't explain on the slide of the Hammersmith that I married another, a radiologist and we thought the chances of us both getting consultant jobs was going to be in, in London and it didn't work out. So Pete got a job at Bedford, I got a job at Luton and Dunstable, and then I moved to Bedford. And then eventually I moved to Addenbrookes. And in those days, multiple changes of posts were really uncommon and always raised eyebrows. And people did a lot of digging around in, the, you know, in my past to see why I had moved. Was there something wrong with me? Did being female in those days affect my career? Well, I was always asked in interviews about my intentions to start a family. Um, maternity leave was limited and on call became much more onerous. But there are positives to my career. I've been extremely fortunate to train in radiology in the 1980s when the revolution in imaging started. So there's always been something new coming along every few years to keep me out of trouble. You know, we had CT, MRI, PET, then we had multi-slice CT, and now we've got all the fusion imaging. And these advances were truly miraculous compared to the techniques of old. I've only ever worked part-time four days a week, and I've managed to raise three great children while juggling my work and my family. And as the family grew, I was able to take on some wider work. And I would encourage you, all of you, to think about taking on wider work for the NHS, so for the college, for... Um, the European Society of Radiology. At Cambridge, we've always been European. Uh, I'm going to skip through education on demand because we're running out of time. So my advice would be consider wider work for the ESR and the RCR. It's highly rewarding and great fun. How many radiologists can say they've dressed up as Harry Potter with Michael Fuchsieger dressed as Hermione? And it's a shame Andrea Rockall's not here, but this is when we did Star Wars. And so there's me, this, uh, the Darth Vader is Adrian Brady, the current president of uh, ESR. And we had great fun doing that. So, you know, only take on additional roles that are rewarding and interesting because if you're not really engaged with it, you won't produce some decent work. So I'd like to give thanks to my family and friends and all my colleagues at Bedford and Addenbrookes who had to put up with me doing all sorts of things. Um, the officers at the RCR, ESR and EVR who entrusted me with enormous work. And to quote Cat Stevens, life is like a maze of doors and they all open from the side you're on and you just have to push on them now and again. I dedicated the gold medal to two important men in my life, and there is a third. One is Professor Sir Robert Steiner, who was born and raised in Vienna and had to leave Vienna because of um, the occupation and finished his training in Ireland. Gold medalist of the, um, of the ESR and an amazing man and mentor. And without him, I wouldn't be standing here today. And the other is my late husband, Peter Hicks, who died in 2021 of advanced prostate cancer 
uh, aged only 65, and he was aware I was going to get the gold medal and was hugely supportive of my work. And the third, and he'll hate me for this, is Adrian Dixon, because Adrian supported me right from the days at Luton and Dunstable and must have seen something in me to encourage me to go further. So I'm very grateful to him. And uh, these are my greatest achievements, my three kids. So thank you all for putting up with hearing about me.